Hello, everyone. Jim Ravel, and I'm the chaplain here at Nussbaum Transportation with Corporate Chaplains of America. And, and I come alongside to support an already amazing team of people, both in the office, in the shop, the drivers, men and women who are just a wonderfully a dedicated group of people. I'm here today to talk to you about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What an interesting idea, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, Tom Wright, a theologian from England, said that the revolution or the, the, uh, the resurrection is the day that the revolution started. Something happened in time that is absolutely shockingly earth changing for human beings. And it doesn't matter what struggles you're facing, what disappointments, what troubles. The resurrection says those things are only temporary for those people that are in Jesus Christ, no matter what happens to you. Whatever the depth of your tragedy, whatever you're facing, whatever kind of death stalks you, whatever loved ones you lost, the resurrection promises a hope beyond what we could ever imagine. And uh, Josh McDowell said, who's a apologist, Christian apologist, or he defends a Christian faith, he said, few people seem to realize that the resurrection of Jesus is the cornerstone to a worldview or to a perspective that impacts all of life. And so really when you get this concept of the res resurrection of Jesus, it, it really does change everything. And it comes by uh, something that God gives us as insight. But I want to, for just a few minutes in the talk, you may be listening today, and I know the company's been growing, and there are people from varying dis perspectives in the, in, the, in the company. Most are followers of Jesus Christ, but there are those of you that maybe, maybe you have no religious background. Maybe you're an agnostic. Maybe you're an atheist. Or maybe you've come in and you're part of a, another, another faith completely, another complete belief system. <laughs> And a, a big question is, how in the world would we know for sure that this happened? Because I'm telling you, everything of my future, your future, the future of the human race, it's pinned on this, that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, it's interesting. Chuck Colson, Charles Colson, was uh, about 50 years ago, was a special counsel to Pre then President Richard Nixon. And Chuck Colson was known as the White House uh, hatchet man. So he was in the inner circle of power uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in the government in the White House at that time. And he was also prominent in what was known as the Watergate scandal, which shocked and rocked our country. It was, I remember as a kid, my mother watched all the televis televised uh, hearings of this proceeding. And what happened was Chuck, because of his role in this, he ended up doing prison time. And there were 12 men 12 men who were part of this whole finagling uh, of this thing called Watergate. And they, they did, they, you know, they, like, for instance, the president had to resign and all of his close colleagues, many of them were imprisoned. And here's what he said. He became a believer in Jesus Christ by going into prison. And uh, in fact, he developed a ministry called um, prison fellowship, and they do a tremendous job reaching out to people. But listen to what Chuck said. Now, he was not a follower of Christ before he went into prison. <laughs> but here's what he said. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? He said, 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and they proclaimed this truth for 40 years, never denying it once. Every one of them was beaten tortured, stoned, put in prison, they would not have endured that if it weren't true. He said Watergate took 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and we couldn't keep a lie held together for three weeks. We, we caved. He said, so you're telling me the 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. So I find it very intriguing how God comes to us in kind of our own language, and he used that situation in Chuck's life. But how did those those 12 apostles stick together for years if the story wasn't really a true story. <coughs> Timothy Keller said, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, 
then why worry about any of it? So think about some of the things he said. Now, if he rose from the dead, you're going to have to face the fact that he said things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread. I am the living water. That I, I've come to give eternal life. If a normal human being, well, wouldn't really be a normal human being. If a human being made this statement, he'd be viewed as abnormal. Well, Jesus made these statements, but what proved the validity of what he said he was and what he taught was his resurrection. And so uh, T Keller continues on. <laughs> he says, the issue on which everything hangs is not whether you like or dislike Jesus's teaching, but it's whether or not he rose from the dead. Because if he rose from death, it changes everything. And so let's talk about this. So in my view, now, and I would just say this to you, if you're having questions about this or you'd like to probe it more, I'd love to have a dialogue with you or talk with you about that because there are some huge evidences. Uh, J. Warner Wallace was a cold case uh, detective in Torrance, California, and he's nationally known. In fact, he's been on, I've seen him on, uh, on Dateline, uh, on North Mission Road, which is on True TV. He won the best cold case award in 2015 for a cold case he had solved. And what he would do is he'd take evidence of many times witnesses had already perished, but he, or, you know, they had already died. He looked at uh, interviews and he looked at evidence, excited, et cetera, and he'd, he'd solve cold case murders. Well, he was an atheist or he, you know, did not believe in God. But in his mid thirties, he decided he'd join his wife in going to church, not because he wanted to go to church, but because he liked his wife and it brought peace in their home. But as, as he was sitting in the, uh, in, in the pew in a service, he looked down and he saw the Bible and he decided he was going to do something and he was going to go out and disprove Christianity. And he was going to use his, the 10, uh, principles that are used in solving cold cases to look at the evidence of the, the testimonies of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and especially focusing on the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so he went in like a detective, and he was going to go kind of unwrap and prove that these this story had a lot of holes in it. Well, here's a guy who's experienced at solving cold case murders and was quite prolific at it, quite nationally known. <laughs> Well, here's what happened when he went through this story, this atheist, uh, cold case, uh, you know, uh, police officer, part of this team. He went through the evidence line by line, and something happened when he put all the evidence together. He was shocked because he said, these guys are telling the truth. This story absolutely makes sense. And only as a cold case detective could discover it, God used that in his life because the... <coughs> The, the way this story is crafted is so, it's so reliable. This is so amazing that you can take it to the bank. And if, if you're interested in reading more, he wrote a couple of books, wrote many books. One of them is called Cold Case Christianity. And he wrote the 10 principles of solving a cold case. And, and he, uh, and he kind of walks through in that book. And another book he has is called God's Crime Scene. God's Crime Scene, which is amazing as he went through. So, so I, I, just wanted to talk, I, I just wanted to begin today by talking to those who may struggle with it. Could this actually be true? But let's, let's say it is true because I believe deeply that it's true. <laughs> How does the death and resurrection of Jesus make a difference for me in my life? I don't want to glean a person out of the Bible that was very near to Jesus. It was a man who was originally known as Cephas, Simon. Jesus renamed him, and he said, you are Peter. In other words, Peter means rock, or he basically called him Rocky. <laughs> he said, you're, you're a solid dude, because he, not because Peter was like that, but because he saw what was on Peter's life. But Peter was a fisherman, which means more than he fished in northern Israel in the Sea of Galilee, more than sticking a pole in a lake. He ran a business. It was, he and two brothers and a father, uh, and they provided... Uh, it was an industry that provided um, supply of fish both to that locale as well as throughout the Roman Empire. So they were quite, um, <laughs> quite prolific as business people in what they did. And, of course, he ran into Jesus. And we find a lot about Peter because he was, I would call him, 
slightly schizophrenic because you find him walking on water and then sinking. You find him saying, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah of God. And then a few minutes later, Jesus, he makes these, uh, Peter makes these bonehead statements. And Peter says, get thee behind me, Satan, not talking to Peter himself, but he got kind of lured in. So Peter was a back and forth person. But there's an incident in Peter's life right at the end of uh, right before Jesus was going to end up going to the cross and they had just had bread and wine which showed that Jesus was going to die although they still weren't getting the signals on this all the disciples were arguing about who's going to be the top dog in this kingdom because they had a whole different perspective of what Jesus was coming to do and they never did get it. So they're talking, Jesus is talking about that he's going to be betrayed. He's going to be put into the hands of, of uh, both the Romans and, and some Jewish authorities there and he's going to be crucified. And Peter makes this assertion. I mean, Peter just spoke out. I mean, he's, he exuded what was a confidence that was a deceived confidence. And I'm telling you, in our lives, we come across deceived confidence that God will he'll lead us to places where we put ourselves out on the limb to the point that he leads us to the end of ourselves so we come to him. So all the other men are saying, you know, they're varying their own ability to stand with Jesus. Peter said this, and I quote, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even die with you. Well, Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, now think about this, within hours, Peter, you think you can get your life together? You think you can stand with me? Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you're going to deny me three times. That You're going to even deny that you know me. And uh, <coughs> so Peter is getting ready now to face the greatest embarrassment in his life. So Jesus ends up going to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he ends up being arrested and I mean, all, every single one of the disciples turn tail and run. They run for the hills. Nobody stays with him. Peter is kind of edging in close enough in a courtyard, hearing what was happening above him in a kind of a praetorium sort of uh, courtroom above where Peter was standing in the courtyard and Jesus was there. And I, I want you to think about, as, as we're thinking of, of the, the crucifixion of Jesus, what Jesus Christ went through. It says they, that those who had, t had taken him into custody, uh, the, the guards, they began to spit on him. Think, have you ever been spit on? Jesus was spit on. If someone just spit right in your face, Jesus was blindfolded. And then they started punching him with their fists and then taunting him and saying, look, uh, prophesy, tell us who hit you. And, I mean, can you imagine being blindfolded and just pummeled? And so this is, here's Jesus, and that was just barely the beginning of what he was facing. But Peter's down, hearing it going on. He's at the, you know, in this courtyard area. And so here's what the scripture says. It says, meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below, and a little servant girl, a servant girl who worked for the high priest came up to him, and she noticed people, or Peter warming himself by the fire. And she looked at him, and she said, you were one of those with Jesus from Nazareth. Peter said, I don't even know what you're talking about. And then he kind of edged out to the entryway. The servant girl saw him standing there from a distance, and she began to tell others around her, look, that's definitely one of them. Second time, Peter says, I don't, I don't, I'm not one of them. <laughs> and then a little bit later, some time had passed, uh, you know, several minutes had passed, he kind of trying to hide out in the crowd, suddenly the bystanders confronted them. And they said, you must be one of them because you're a Galilean. We can hear your language. We can hear how you're saying this. Here's what Peter said. Now listen to these words. Peter before, hours before, he said, I'm going to stand with you. I got your back. Jesus, I'm going to die with you. Here's what Peter said in front of that group. <laughs> he said, a curse on me if I am lying. I don't even know this man you're talking about. Now, remember what Jesus said, by tomorrow morning, you're going to deny me and the rooster's going to crow. All of a sudden, this imagery passes in front of Peter's mind. And before the rooster crows twice, Jesus said, you're going to deny me that you even know me. The rooster crowed. He heard it. Peter just broke down in an absolute weeping, sobbing, because he had uh, completely not only 
denied that he uh, that he had been with Jesus. He denied that he even knew him. Think about that. What kind of egregious? What, I mean, who does that? Well, as I begin to think about this, I think we all have times in our life where we have failed miserably, and we thought we could. We really had it together. Peter Peter did not think that he would ever abandon Jesus, but he did. But what what would happen? <laughs> Think for a minute with me, because I begin to think of trying to put myself in the emotions of what Peter was dealing with. I mean, he completely abandoned the one he had been in a close relationship for three years. Astonishing things happened. He saw him multiply bread. He had him walk on water. I mean, they had just so many miracles that happened, some of the teachings that were astonishing. <laughs> and what would happen if Jesus never rose from the dead? Peter, on that Friday night, on that Saturday before that Sunday of resurrection, it was a dark, dank time of despair, of shame, of guilt, of embarrassment. Because he honestly, I mean, if I were putting myself in Peter's mind, I would be absolutely in deep despair because, I mean, I had abandoned Jesus. They had no, uh, they, they really had no spot in their thought process that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. And I know that's true because when the women came on the Sunday morning, you know what they were equipped with was a bunch of embalming fluid because they actually thought they were going to find a dead body there. They really did not understand this idea of the resurrection. In fact, they were talking among themselves, who's going to move the stone away so we can at least, you know, do the appropriate completing of the embalming of Jesus's body. And of course, when they got there, the angel says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Well, Jesus rose, and Jesus appeared to the disciples on the Sunday night of the resurrection. They're locked in a room because they're hiding, and all of a sudden, here comes Jesus with an actual body, a spiritual body. They're shocked. They're, they're amazed by this. Here's Jesus standing among them, and Thomas wasn't there on the, this occasion. And, I mean, they're almost speechless. And he basically looked, looked at them and said, hey, you, got, you have anything to eat? I'll show you I'm really real. And they hand him, handed him the leftover fish, and he ate it in front of them. And they were shocked by this. I mean, this, was, this is a very detailed story. A week later, uh, Thomas was not there. Well, two, a week later, Thomas was there. And Jesus appeared to him and said, Thomas, I want you to touch Go ahead, touch my hands, touch my side. <laughs> These wounds are healed. I want you to show I'm really real. It is I. I've risen. And so this was an astonishing thing. Well, the third, I want to focus now on the third incident of the resurrection. Because it happened, the third time he appeared to them is in John chapter 21. And so this is this story just it blows my mind. It, it's, just, it, it's an amazing story. <laughs> it says, <laughs> later, Jesus appeared to the disciples again by the Sea of Galilee. And here's how it happened. And so it names several of them, about seven of them. They said, we're going fishing. P or Peter said, I'm going fishing. And the other six said, well, we're going to come too. So they're out on the lake. They're fishing all night. And when it was just the break of dawn, they hear a voice of a person standing on the beach, and they could not quite make out who the person was. Now, it's very interesting. A number of years ago, I think seven, eight years ago, I went to Israel, and I actually stayed at what, what, what historians feel would be the, about the spot where this encounter happened in a little kibbutz on the Sea of Galilee, kind of on the, the east side of the Sea of Galilee. And I got up early in the morning just to kind of get a little taste of what it would be like. And out in the boat, out in the lake was a was a boat about a hundred yards out, and there was this little mist on the lake. I could I could see the boat, but I couldn't make out the person. I think they could see me, and they couldn't make out me. And well, this is what was happening. Here is Jesus standing on the beach. He's going out looking for them who out, went out fishing, and he calls out. He says, "Hey, boys, you caught any fish?" <laughs> they said, "No." He said, well, I'm telling you what you do. Throw the net on the right side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did it. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in the lake or in the net. It was just packed with fish. Well, John, the disciple Jesus loves, turned to Peter and he says, oh, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. Here he is. And when Peter heard this, now I want you to understand this. Peter saw it was the Lord. Something burst out in him. 
that and and he put on he had taken his tunic off because he was out working so he put his tunic back on because he had stripped down for work he jumped into the water and man he hightailed about a probably about a hundred yards or into the into the shore and he left all of his friends caring for these all of these fish now listen to this story because jesus the newly resurrected lord of the universe what is he going to do with his power and see, this is a great question. We learn so many things about what God's like through stories like this. It says, when they got there, they, pr- they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over the charcoal fire, and some bread. Now, think about this. The newly resurrected Lord of the universe, how would you like your eggs? Scrambled or easy, over easy? Sausage or Bacon. Bagels or, I mean, think, talk about God lowering himself to come in the details of our life. And especially to every single one of these had abandoned Jesus Christ at his greatest hour of need. And this is why this story gives me such hope. This is why resurrection is so astonishing. Jesus Christ meets us when we've been the most horrific royal flops in and following him, he comes to us in an amazing way. And so then Jesus said, well, bring some of the fish you caught. And they brought in, they found 153 fish. And Jesus said this, I mean, these are big fish. I, these fish are very large. Uh, they call them Peter's fish today. And you can eat them. You can actually have them on the lake. You can, uh, they serve these de- delicious fish, very large. So there was 153 of them. And then Jesus says, now come and have some breakfast. Then Jesus served them bread and fish. Talk about the server of the year award, God himself serving them fish. (laughs) And it says this is the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples. And then after breakfast, and this is the powerful thing that happened. Around this fire, three times, Jesus came to Peter. And he said, Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? And there's a debate on what that these mean. And I think it probably means that he was pointing to the fish because why, why do you think that Peter most likely went back fishing? That's my great question that I've thought of as I was meditating on this passage. And I think even though Jesus rose from the dead, I think Peter in his mind thought he had so egregiously failed Jesus Christ that there was no hope. He's going to just have to go back to what he was comfortable with. I mean, he had somehow lowered his stock that, I mean, he had so blown it that there was no hope of restoration. But can you see this? Jesus came out looking for his disciples and especially Peter and especially Peter. And he sat down with him and he said, Peter, do you love me more than these? (coughs) And Peter says, Lord, you know, I love you. And Jesus says, now think about this. He says, feed my lambs feed my lambs. And then Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Well, then take care of my sheep. Jesus said a third time, Jesus asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked him the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, I want you to think about something. It wasn't just about forgiving Jesus, uh, Peter's past. I mean, shockingly embarrassing failure. He forgave that. But it was also about giving him a future. I mean, would you, I mean, it's the most precious thing to Jesus, who's the great shepherd of the sheep, are people. And you're going to trust the care and the feeding of, and the future you know, uh, encouragement and, and strengthening faith to a man who had failed this egregiously. I mean, th- this, that's what Jesus did. This is what's so shocking about the resurrection because there's forgiveness in it. There's restoration in it. There's empowering that God would take us places we could never get to on our own. So let me wrap this up by asking you, <coughs> what does this story tell us? What does it tell us? What does the resurrection tell us? The first thing is this. People, you know, people make this phrase, they'll say, I, you know, I found the Lord. Well, maybe you found him, but I'm telling you what the story tells us is that God came looking for us. Peter, Jesus came looking for Peter and he found him because if you have a relationship with the Lord, it didn't start with you. 
we come to him because God started it. God works in our heart. God draws us. And what we begin to understand, you find the tenderness of Jesus in this story, which is amazing. <laughs> I mean, how he, how he restored Peter, how he worked with him, how he prepared breakfast, all of these kinds of things. But the scripture says God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He came looking for Peter, and he came looking for me. He came looking for you. This is the great story of the resurrection. And he entered into death. He conquered, and he rose from the dead to, enter, to, 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 to turn, to transform lives that were headed nowhere and to take us somewhere we could never get to on our own. So God comes to us. Secondly, <laughs> here's what we learned, that our greatest failures are not the end but they're the beginning. They're the beginning of something new if we allow the Lord to come into the middle of those things. And what the Lord is doing, he's ever leading us to helplessness <laughs> so that we rely on him. And Peter forever, his, his overconfidence, Lord, I promise I'll be with you to the end. These other 11 might you know, hit the eject button and get out, but not me. Well, Peter began to realize, I don't have strength to follow you, Lord. And so the Lord brought him to the end of himself. And see, what God's doing is um, he's cleansing us from faulty ideas about ourselves, our, our overconfidence, and even faulty ideas about God himself. Because we have in our mind kind of how things ought to go. Well, the disciples had in their mind the idea that Jesus, as the Messiah, was going to come and he was going to overthrow Rome. And so they had this expectation in their mind that um, that Jesus was going to kind of overthrow the government there and they were going to set up this kingdom and it was going to be this cool physical realm. But instead, he gets on a donkey and, and instead of overthrowing Rome, he heads to the temple and he's saying, I want to get inside the human heart to change the human heart. And a lot of times people quit. <laughs> they think they quit on God. But here's what Meister Eckhart said. And I love this quote. He said, when some people quit God, they're actually getting closer to the real God. And that's a good thing. The God they're quitting on isn't the God we encounter in the scripture. He's not a God as he really is. See, Jesus was challenging Peter to realize the worthlessness of his own strength. But the kind of kingdom that he was bringing, which was it ran through the cross, it ran through the shedding of his blood, it ran through the giving of his life, and it ran through the power of his resurrection. In fact, the very first words Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, there's Theirs is the kingdom of God. What that actually says is, congratulations when you find yourself spiritually bankrupt. That's when the kingdom of heaven starts, is when you don't have an answer, but he does. And I'm telling you, when there's a death, you need a resurrection. Peter died to all of his expectations through his failures, and he allowed Jesus to come in. And so then we also find that not only does God forgive our past, but we have a future. Just like I said, Jesus said, you're going, to take, you're going to feed my lambs. You're going to take care of my sheep. You're going to feed my sheep. And I think about this. 50 days after Peter had egregiously denied that he, uh, that he didn't even know Jesus, guess who was the person who stood on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out? It was Peter who spoke, who stepped up, and they heard them speaking in their own languages because God wants to come to our language. And they heard them speak in the wonderful works of God. And Peter steps up and gives this amazing sermon you can read. And he said, look, this, is, this has been spoken of by the prophet Joel. This is the outpouring of the Spirit. Uh, and how, how, could you trust, how could you trust Peter to share this message when he was such a failure? Because the kingdom of God is a powerful, powerful uh, a witness that our greatest failures, in fact, where we failed becomes the very, the very soil from which, from which the richest crops are grown. It was Henry Nouwen who said, to the degree to which we grieve our own losses and allow Jesus into the middle of those is the direct proportion to the, direct, to, to the quality of the compassion that we can offer to others. See, it's where Peter received comfort 
of his failure. He knew what it was to fail. He knew that he had nothing in himself, but he knew that it was all in Jesus. And he says these words in his book. He says, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. See, what the resurrection is about <laughs> is that when, we're, when it seems like things are the worst, when it seems like things are dead, when it things like, seems like things are hopeless, that God comes into the middle of that when we turn our life to him and there's a resurrection that happened because of Jesus Christ. Well, I, let me read you one passage of scripture before I close, and then I want to tell you the, a quote of one of the astronauts that walked on the moon. It's an amazing story. But Paul was another man who was a totally unlikely candidate to be a, 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 a someone that would promote the gospel and share the gospel to Gentiles. I mean, he was really a terrorist. He'd killed or imprisoned Christians, and he was a man just incensed against Christianity, and he ran into Jesus, resurrected on the road, and it changed his life. And let me read you his quote about his life. He said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who's given me the strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my violence, I persecuted his people. But God in his mercy, because I did it in ignorance and unbelief, oh, how generous and gracious the Lord was to me. He filled me with faith and love that comes from Jesus. And then he said, this is a trustworthy saying. Everyone should accept this, quote, unquote. Here's what you have to accept. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, unquote. Then he said, and I was the worst of sinners. <laughs> but God in his mercy, so that Christ could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners, then others will realize that they too can believe in him and have eternal life. Basically, Paul was saying this. If God can, if God can take my total failures, he can rinse them clean, and he can come in and make me a brand brand new person he i become a billboard of the grace of god that's true of peter that's true of paul and paul then breaks out into praise and he says all glory and honor to god forever and ever he's the eternal king who never dies see he's the one who's risen from the dead so god did come to the earth and jesus christ did die on a cross and jesus christ did rise again and it doesn't matter what you're facing and what your past is. The future when you're in him is an amazing thing. So I close with this story from uh, James Irwin, who's the eighth man to walk on the moon. There have been 12 men who've walked on the moon. Of course, you know the first one was Neil Armstrong. Perhaps you knew that. <laughs> and he said uh, th that when he stepped on the moon, he said, this is one small step for a man, but one giant leap for a mankind. That's the first man. But this eighth man was James Irwin. And when he went to the moon, there was something that happened to him spiritually where he began to muse on this whole story of the resurrection of Jesus. And here's a quote from the eighth person who walked on the moon, James Irwin. He said, God decided that he would send his son, Jesus Christ, into the blue planet. And it's through faith in Jesus that we can relate to God. He said, as I travel around the world, I tell people the answer is Jesus. That Jesus walking on the earth is more important than man walking on the moon. That's an amazing story. But what's even more amazing that he died our death and he rose again. And you might be saying, man, wouldn't that have been cool to have breakfast with Jesus? To have him serve me? But do you know there's a verse in the book of Revelation that's primarily written to Christians? And it says this in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. It's Jesus speaking. He says, I stand, look, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I want to come in and have dinner with them. So maybe you've listened today and you've never chose to invite Christ in your life. You can do that. They can say, Lord Jesus, I believe something. You died for me. You rose again. I don't understand everything that was just said in this little talk, but I'm inviting you into my life. Come into my life. Or maybe you're someone and you've been, you've maybe at some point in your life, you turn your life to Christ, but you need to open your life up to him. It's not a knock you hear. It's his voice. Anyone hears my voice. I want to come in and have dinner with, with you. Or maybe you're just someone you're overflowing in Jesus. 
listen, let's keep taking him up on this dinner invitation to fellowship with him because he is amazing. So I want to pray a prayer for you uh, this Easter. And Lord, I want to ask this. It's a prayer from Ephesians where you said that you'd flood the eyes of our light with, with the eyes of our heart with light that we could see you better. And Lord, you'd fill us with the hope of our calling. There's such hope in the resurrection. <laughs> and we would know the insurpassing great power toward us who believe that those who know Christ have the living resurrection power of Jesus living in them. Help us, Lord, in those points in our life where it seems like there's no hope. Maybe it's in a marriage. Maybe it's in our finances. Maybe it's in a stress we're dealing with. Maybe it's in a health situation. Maybe it's a loss we've experienced. But Lord, we welcome you in to the core of what we're facing. And we thank you that you're alive and you're with us. And we pray this, God, in your name. Amen. So I want to give you an invitation. If you would like to connect with me, <laughs> I'm available 24-7. Uh, my number is 877-322-CHAP. That's 877-322-2427. My extension is 5017. I'd love to talk with you. Man, if this has raised questions in your mind about anything, please reach out to me. I love to discuss this because, listen, Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And that is the sign that sin has been dealt with and our future in him has tremendous hope, but we have to let him into our life. God bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful Easter. <laughs>